Well, praise the Lord, here we are again, and we're looking at the book of Thessalonians and talking about the overall theme of excelling in faith and love. Excelling in faith and love. As we look through the whole book of First Thessalonians over the next number of days, but today our subtitle would be Christ Who Delivers. And I think we need to understand that there is a deliverance ministry of Christ where he delivers us and sets us free. Amen. So thank you for joining us again today. Pray that your Lord will, uh, the Lord will be good to you. We've been busy. We've actually had a few people drop in from out in BC, our, one of our grandkids, and we're grateful for that. And and then today they're heading on, so we're grateful for the fellowship. We're still working on trying to get rid of this COVID thing. If you know of anybody who needs it, let it know. We'll send it on to them. No, we won't. But it just seems like sometimes it holds on for a little while. And we've had to make some changes because of that. But we're doing okay, other than a little bit of cough here and there. So keep us in prayer. But today, Christ who delivers. And again, some of these things, as I think about them and, and pray about them, as we prepare ourselves each day for teaching in the morning, is, you know, you have to ask the question sometimes, do we really, really believe that? Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Sometimes we, yeah, Christ is our deliverer. But, I mean, how often do we really grasp the depths of what it is that Christ does for us? And how he intercedes for us and ministers for us and sits at the right hand of the Father for us. You know, all these things. And then to make a statement, yes, Christ who delivers. Well, sometimes we need to ask ourselves the, the question is, do we really, do we really have, first of all, believe it? And second of all, do we really grasp the fullness of what it means to be delivered? And how he delivers, both in the physical realm and in the emotional realm and in the spiritual realm. You know, we were talking about this over the last couple of days, Colwyn and I, concerning uh, Jesus's fleshly body and how he died on the cross and then how the Father delivered him from death and resurrected his physical body again, delivered him from death physically and brought him into the, a physical life again to be amongst us before he ascended up on earth. And it was just thinking how how both Jesus Christ and the Father are in the and the Holy Spirit are in the deliverance ministry. And so today, when we go to First Thessalonians chapter one, we're going to look at this whole area of uh, verses eight through to 10, a little bit about this area of deliverance. And you're not going to see it at the first, in the first couple of verses, because it shows up, but I've extended it back over the whole section. So again, he goes to us in verse 8, and he reminds us. And one of the things you should do when you look for things in the Bible is look at how often certain words get used. And it seems like in First Thessalonians, the word for is used a lot. You know, for this reason, for, you know, this, there's always something going on that something is done for a purpose. Uh, something is given for a purpose, you know. And we see Paul telling the Thessalonian church this kind of idea because he says in verse 8, For from you the word of, lot of the Lord has sounded forth not only into Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Now, he just told us that again in verse 7, where he says, so that you became examples to all the Macedonians and the Achaia who believe. Now he's going on and saying, for that reason, for... You know, because you've been in examples of faith, now for that reason, the word of the Lord has gone forth. And I think that's so important. And I believe that as we go on, that the word of God has gone forth, has sounded forth in every place. 
And it, and I see that to really grasp what deliverance is, is to tie it together with the word faith. When we have faith to believe that God can deliver, he can set the captive free. And that takes place you know, both with the individual and with the church. And, and, and I got thinking about this, how often when it came to the time when Jesus was either going to do a miracle or something to do with deliverance or, or whatever it may be, he, he would ask the people, do you have faith? You know, do you have faith that God can do this? And I think that sometimes when it comes to the deliverance ministry, if you were to call it that, you know, that do we have the faith? Are we delivered by faith? And I see that here because <clears throat> it goes on. It says, but also in every place, your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. The faith of God who delivered them, we're going to see who delivered them from all kinds of idols and all kinds of worldly ways. That same faith has now going out and ministering to others and it's bringing deliverance from them. You know, often when we think of the word deliverance, we think of, you know, like demons and and the occult and other things like that. And that is true. There is all of that. And God delivers from that. But also, I believe that there is everyday type things that we pray that we need to, by faith, ask God to deliver us from. You know, I'm praying by faith that God would deliver me from this little chest cold that we have. Or some of you may be praying that you be delivered from something else that's going on in your life. And so often when we look at this word, we, we, we don't get the bigger picture of that, that Christ is the one who comes to deliver us from bondages, from, from, from death to life. I mean, there is a multitude of things that we have to believe. Remember, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning from the end. If he's the beginning from the end, can he also deliver us over all areas of our lives? And to realize that that deliverance comes forth by faith. And so Paul was saying to the Thessalonian church, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God. And I think that's the key when it comes to deliverance ministry is what is our faith towards God? Where are we at in our level of faith and believing? And and the thing is, it's a, like we talked about yesterday, it's a growing process that we are growing into because we need to mature and understand that God is doing a work in us and he's wanting us to grow by faith but as we grow by faith that means there's certain things in our lives that maybe daily we need to be delivered from and it can be a process sometimes some people receive a miracle and are delivered instantly from an issue in their life and for some others it seems like it takes days or weeks or months to get it delivered to get all the roots of whatever is binding them to be able to get them snipped off so they can have total deliverance. Sometimes we don't know the depth of certain things in our lives that we need to be delivered from. And, 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 and it's really a walk of faith. Do we believe that God can deliver us from some of these habits or some of these lifestyles? And sometimes it's taken us years to get into them. And sometimes we can be instantly delivered from them and walk away from them. And sometimes it will take time through the power of the word, through the power of prayer, getting into the word, letting the word get into you to deliver you from those things. And not only to pray for our own personal deliverance, but to pray for deliverance for others that we know that need to be set free. Some lifestyles, some habits, some things that are going on, you know. Often people have allowed themselves to fall into bondage, and now that they're in bondage, they need a Christ who delivers. And I see that. So Paul was beginning to open up the door. Your faith towards God has gone out. Your faith towards God, people around the area have seen how you have been set free by faith in Jesus Christ from various things. 
Then he goes on in verse 9 and uses the word for again. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn from idols and serve the living and true God. So Paul goes on now and he's going to say, hey, you got delivered from idols. I, You know, culture and idols sometimes in some countries run hand in hand. What I mean by culture, like a lot of times people are bound up in things culturally and because they're bound up in things culturally, they don't open the door for deliverance spiritually. And so when I've traveled around the world, a lot of people struggle with giving their faith to Jesus Christ because they don't want to pass from one culture of life, you know, maybe the way they've been with their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, and to step out into faith in Jesus Christ. For a lot of people, it could mean death, or it could be uh, means that you could be expelled from the home or from the community or whatever, uh, because you're not willing to continue on with the traditions of men or the traditions of culture. And Paul is saying to the church here at Thessalonians, you know, praise the Lord. I, I'm so thankful that you've been delivered from idols. And that not only that, that you welcomed us and that through the power of God, you turn from these idols to serve a true God and to serve a living God. See, North America it was a thing on TV last night that talked about that the majority of the people are more and more, especially in Canada, are turning away from religion, any kind of religion. They're turning away. But it's interesting in other parts of the world, where we go to, there is a different religion almost on every street corner. You know what I mean? And there's all kinds of idols all over the place. North America has turned to the God of science, where other parts of the world, probably two thirds of the world, you know, still believes in idols and still believes in all kinds of spirits and things like this. And this was what was going on in Thessalonica. And Paul says, I thank God that you welcomed us and that you turned to God from idols. That was a big deal. You know, again, if we don't understand, you know, uh, I remember being in one home in India. It was funny. Uh, I shouldn't say it was funny, because, but it, to me it was a little bit humorous. Uh, one of the family members uh, worshipped uh, Christ. Another family member worshipped uh, Buddhism, and another family member worshipped uh, Hinduism, all in the same house. And they all had, didn't they call in a, remember that one family? They all had a little different altar. And and it was funny that you could walk through the house and walk through the different idols, as it were. And uh, so they had determined instead of splitting up, they would all go, they would all still stay in the same house but each would have their own little place of worship. And I thought, wow, that, that's confusing, but that happens a lot in the other side of the world. See, the other side of the world believes there's spirits everywhere. The other side of the world believes there's the, there is the evilness of demonicness and all those kinds of things. I know in North America and Europe, we don't. <laughs> but sometimes I think we need to get our eyes opened a little bit because that uh, the prince of this world is quite busy being deceptive and binding people up where they need to be delivered from things that are idols, things that are made by by hands or things that have made, you know, that we have we have bought or we worship or we hold on to and we begin to give them a greater place in our lives. Where Paul was saying here, I thank God for you. You have turned from idols from the worshiping of things or created things, you have turned from all those things and you have turned to a true God. So by him saying a true God means that there was other gods. But now there is a true God. And not only this, he goes on and he talks about a living God. You know, can you imagine people that are worshiping, you know, created images you know, uh, go to shrines and bow down before images. You know, uh, I know 
there was this one place over in in uh, Myanmar where the area that you could bow down before the 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 uh, Buddha was full. So what they did is they had a camera on the Buddha, and then there was an overflow area. And I just thought, this, this isn't this interesting? Where you could go into the overflow area, and and you could take and put your mat down. And and now the picture of Buddha was on the TV, and so now you could bow down before the Buddha on TV. And I just thinking, wow, you know, this this is a God that isn't true, and it's a God that's not living. But people were coming by the hundreds to bow down in front of this TV and to worship this God. Well. I think we have other idols that, you know, we may think that that was strange and funny, but I bet you there's a lot of television programs that people watch throughout the week in some ways that, you know, they bow down. They don't want to miss the series. They don't want to miss, you know, what happened from week because if you miss one, then you won't know next week what the next one. And I mean, you know, and so we, we look at people around the world and we say, yeah, they have got physical idols that they worship, but... I can tell you that we also in North America and Europe also have lots of idols and things that we worship. Can you say amen to that? <clears throat> so Paul was saying, I thank God for you believers that you serve a true God. And that's the question. Those of you who are watching from the other side of the world and are caught up in other types of, of religions, are you worshiping a true God? where you can speak to God and God can speak to you. Are you worshiping a living God? He's not dead. He didn't, you know, walk on the earth and is buried, you know, um, someplace. And you keep a little morsel of that person. And, and then you begin to worship, worship their hair or worship their bone. or, I mean, I, I've seen it all. And the question you need to ask, are you worshiping and serving a true God and a living God. So we see that that we are delivered by faith and that because of that we are we can be delivered from idols. But thirdly as we go into verse 10, we can see that we're delivered by Christ Jesus himself. So we're we're given the idea here in verse 10 you know where it says and to wait for his son from heaven whom raised from the dead who even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So here we are, you know, Paul is saying, thank God that you're worshiping the true and living God. And that not only that, but you're waiting patiently for his, the return of his son from heaven. You know, you've been delivered from the things of this world. You've been delivered from the bondage of death. And now you have been receiving the light of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and you've been delivered by the name of Jesus Christ. That every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he, and he, and he talks about this in such a way. Notice what he says here. And to wait for his son from heaven. So we know that Jesus has sent it up unto heaven. Wait for his son from him. Whom he raised from the dead. Well, who raised him from the dead? Well, God the Father raised him from the dead. He was raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the one true living God raised Jesus physically from death. He physically died and he was now delivered from that physical death and is now in heaven. To do what? To deliver us just like we were, <clears throat> excuse me, in bondage and death, we now also are delivered from death unto life. Amen? And that's what Paul was trying to cause them to remember. But there's a little thing that gets tied on here. Not only are they also, are we also raised from the death of sin and trespasses and are going to be given and are given eternal life. So we're delivered from that, and then we've been brought into a place. We've been unhooked, unchained. The cords and the ropes are broken of this world. We've been delivered from that, and now we have been given life in Christ Jesus. 
And so Paul was saying, even as the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him in heaven, he will raise you from the dead and eventually seats you in heaven also. Isn't that beautiful? Can't wait to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. But there's another little statement that just gets stuck on the end here. And I put it down because we need to understand that Jesus has also come to deliver us not only for the things that we are in the present, but also in the things that are still coming. There's more yet to come. Do you see that tacked on to the end of verse 10? Who Jesus, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. You know, there is some challenging times in talking to people. There's a lot of wrath and anger and hatred and malice that's out there right now. You know, and it's getting worse towards Christians all the time. And there's becoming more persecution and everything else that's taking place around the world. But Paul tacks on to the end of this verse of deliverance. He tacks on there that also we will be delivered not only for the things that we're facing today, but also delivered in the things to come yet down the road. See, Jesus knows everything about us. He knows us from the beginning, and he knows us from the end. He is. He knows how he has delivered us. He also knows how to deliver us today. And he also knows how to deliver us in the wrath, yet, which is yet to come. I don't know about you, but that should give you hope. That should show you that we serve a God of mercy and love who delivers. So just to review, we're delivered by faith. We've been delivered from idols. We've been delivered by Christ Jesus himself. And that we have also been delivered from the wrath which is yet to come. And that deliverance is the idea of that he'll give us the strength the ability, the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding on how to pass through it. You know, our physical bodies undergo all kinds of challenges. But the key is, is what God is going to do with us spiritually when we go to be with him and, and receive that new creation, the old man put away, a new body, a new name, you know, that is written down in glory. Amen. So I pray today as we conclude on this and think about how Christ, how he is the one who delivers. And I want to pray that that the deliverance ministry of faith will increase in you today, that you will have a greater faith, that whatever you may be facing today, that you will have the faith to believe that God will deliver you. Whatever thing that you're holding on to or whatever thing that you're worshiping, maybe you don't know it right now, but that God would open up your eyes and see that what you're holding on to, which is more important than Jesus Christ himself, to realize that he can deliver you from that and bring you into the place of knowing the true and living God. And to realize that the power of deliverance is in the name of Jesus Christ. That the same power that delivered him from the death will also deliver us. And then to, to really grasp that in this deliverance ministry that Jesus has for us, that he has not only delivered us in the past, the present, but he will continue to deliver us in the future. Whatever we may face, whatever may come upon us, I believe Jesus Christ can and will do that. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to see how Paul was grateful for the Thessalonian church, how they had been delivered, how they had been delivered from the bondages that were around them in their own city, in their own places of worship. And they had come into a, a leaving idols and being delivered from idols and coming into the place of following you, Jesus. And we thank you how that when we follow you, that truly you deliver us. And I thank you, Lord, that you also remind us, not only do you deliver us, but you will deliver us in the things yet to come. Even in the things that are going to be difficult and maybe struggles or trials down the road, that will yet to come, you will deliver us. Lord, we have a hope that's in eternity, a hope that is everlasting, 
a hope that is a life that we will spend to you with you forever and ever. And Lord, we thank you that you've taken us out of the grips of this world and delivered us into your glorious kingdom. And we give you praise now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I pray that that has helped to have a little bit better understanding of how Christ is one who delivers. Amen. We love you. Keep on keeping on. And Lord willing, we're going to pray throughout the day that God continues to deliver not only things that we need to be delivered from, but as we pray for family members and children and grandchildren and whatever churches, that that fullness of God's deliverance ministry, you know, around the world and all these different countries that we've been praying for, that God's deliverance ministry, the fullness from beginning to end will be completed according to his will. Amen. Love you. Keep on keeping on. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Amen. Bye-bye.